Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour back in our Father's Word, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul just teaching concerning the last trump and then how all things are put under God's purpose and death is destroyed. And that's the way it's going to be is when, when that time comes to pass, their death will have no victory. And I would remind you again of, of Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, where the whole purpose of Christ coming to this earth was as Savior, yes. But one of the main things was to destroy death, which is to say the devil, to get him off of people's backs whereby they're not tempted and you will not be bothered with that any longer if you overcome. Otherwise, you'll probably be spending some time with him in the last um, the throes of um, this earth age. So having said that, we come to that um, that particular period when death is destroyed and we pick it up in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 55. And how does it read? It says, O death, where is thy sting? It doesn't exist any longer. O grave, where is thy victory? And it is true that the grave has no victory. You know, uh, the word translated hell in the English version of the Bible is always grave or Suel, or it is Gehenna, which is the garbage pit outside of Jerusalem. It's not the burning hell that is the lake of fire at the end of the millennium, which takes place at this time. But many times God has warned this. Another time would be, <coughs> excuse me, in the great book of Hosea, chapter 13, and we read in verse 14 again, Hosea meaning salvation. And this is what it saves you from. Verse 14, God speaking, I will ransom, that is to say redeem, them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be thy plagues. O grave, I will be thy destruction. Repentance shall be hid from mine eyes. I mean, I'm not changing my mind. I'm not repenting. I'm going to destroy death. I'm going to destroy the grave, and we're going to have eternal life for those that overcome. The question is, where are you going to be? We're right down now where it counts as to your, the book of life is open. Your name is there. And all the good things you have done, it's written. All the bad things you have done, they're there unless you've repented for them. You see, God's not going to repent from doing this, but you can repent from your sins and ask that forgiveness. They're erased. They're done away. And you have a clean slate. And when this time comes by and death is destroyed, you don't want to be destroyed with it. And I would remind you again of Matthew chapter 10, verse 28 that we covered in the last lecture. Don't, don't fear someone that can destroy your flesh body but rather you respect and love and fear he who can destroy the flesh, but he can also cause your spiritual body, your soul, to perish. And that is God himself. And this is what this comes down to. It's called the second death. It is destroyed. It is the death of the soul of those that don't make it. Returning then to chapter 15, 1 Corinthians um, and uh, verse 56 reads, the sting of death is sin, <clears throat> excuse me, and the strength, strength, strength of sin is the law. In other words, the law lets you know when you sin. That's what the law is good for. <clears throat> excuse me, the law is not bad. It's people that are bad. And what the law does, and this is why you want to be pretty familiar with it, 
The, it, it lets you know when you are sinning so you can do something about it. That that is natural, not a sin, as many people might think. But that that goes against God's law, that indeed is a sin. And certainly uh, being familiar with both the law, ordinances, and statutes, and commandments of God, many, those are different things. Some of the ordinances, such as blood ordinances, have done away with. Christ's blood stopped all of them. But the law will never change. As long as you have gravity, as long as you have God's common law, natural law, it's here. And, and what it does, it's good for you. It lets you know when you do sin. Verse 57. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. How do, how do you overcome? Through the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus meaning Yahshua, which is to say Yahweh's Savior, and Christos, that is to say the Anointed One, the one that can anoint you and bring salvation into your life on behalf of our Heavenly Father. Verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast. You make a stand. And, and, and I mean you stand good, okay? Uh, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Anytime you work for the Lord, with the Lord, and about the Lord, you're going to be blessed. Okay. You know, that, that is good works that actually weave together the fine linen that makes your robe in heaven. Documentation, Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 and 8. <clears throat> but what is it that goes with you? There's only one thing that you can take with you from earth to heaven. That is to say to that dispensation of time, to correctly state it. You can read of it in Revelation chapter 14, verse 13. Only one thing follows you, it is your works. So your works are very important. And works can be simply um, a mother taking care of a good family, raising a Christian. That's good works. And, and it's, on, it's on her record. It's there in the book of life. It's recorded. And nobody can erase that and, and will not erase it. Those good works, they go with her. And your good works go with you. That's what you're judged by, in, in a sense. What's in the book? And, um, and certainly it does make a great deal of difference. You're always blessed in serving the living God. Okay, and um, next verse, please. We go with um, chapter 16, verse 1. A little change of subject, the salutation of 1 Corinthians. Verse 1 reads, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. You know, Paul never took a salary, and he always took up offerings. He never used it himself. He sent it to the big boys down in Jerusalem. And they weren't all that fond of him. They didn't necessarily treat him all that good. But he loyally uh, took the offering so that they could function in Jerusalem and operate there. Um, verse 2, Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God has uh, prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. In other words, I, I don't want you passing any plates while I'm there. I, I've got teaching to do, and I don't want to be bothered with it. Get it done. Verse 3, And when I come, whomsoever you have approved by your letters, then will I send to bring your liberality, uh, liberality unto Jerusalem. In other words, um, it, uh, you never left one with the collection plate or bag, as it was called then. You always had two witnesses. And, and it's a good way to have that that uh, when you have a work of God, you set it up as a double witness to everything. That way there's no problems. 
and it cuts way down on arrows. Verse 4. And if it be meet that I go also, they shall go with me. In other words, you get them together and whoever you name by letter, I will trust them. I will go with them and we'll, we'll, we'll take it down to the boys. Verse 5. Now, I will come unto you when I shall pass through Macedonia, for I do pass through Macedonia. 6. And it may be that I will abide, yea, and winter with you. Well, wouldn't that be something we can, what a study, that you may bring me on my journey whithersoever I go. Now, I'm going to winter with you there through um, the cold spell, and hey, we'll have a good old Bible study, and we'll spend some good time together. Verse 7, For I will not see you now by the way, but I trust to tarry a while with you, if the Lord permit. This is something when you're serving God, you want to always remember. Does God permit it? That's why you always ask your father in, according to his will, not yours. Because you see, <clears throat> he knows what he wants you to do. He knows what, who he wants you to touch. He knows who you, he wants you to plant a seed with, whereby God's work is done. As Christ sits on the throne until all of his enemies are made his footstool, God's elect must uh, rally. Verse 8, But I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost. I'm going to spend the 50th day after Passover there. Verse 9, For a great door and effectual is, is, is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries. In other words, there were many cliques in the church there. He, he knew it, and Chloe, in the very beginning of this book, notified him that uh, some thought, well, I'm, I'm the church of Apollos, and I'm the church of Cephas, Peter, that is to say, I'm the church of Paul, instead of the church of God, the church of Jesus Christ. They, they uh, took to men rather than the word. He didn't like that, and it shouldn't be. We have one Savior, we have one shepherd, and that shepherd is the Lord Jesus Christ under the Father. Verse 10. Now if Timotheus, or Timothy that is, come, see that he may be with you without fear. For he worketh the work of the Lord, as I also do. You can trust him. He will not teach you anything different. He's my student, and I'm his mentor. He will do nothing but do you right. So you, you treat him right as well when he comes by. Paul always thinking of the saints and, and uh, keeping order and keeping what is fair and just. Verse 11, Let no man therefore despise him, but conduct him forth in peace. You, you supply and send him away peacefully, that he may come unto me, for I look for him with the brethren. I'm anxious to see him. I want to get a report of what he has done and how the people have re interacted and so forth. Paul, Paul loved Timothy, and Timothy also loved Paul. They did a good work together in many, many places. Uh, verse 12, As touching our brother Apollos, I greatly desire him to come unto you with the brethren, but his will was not at all to come at this time, but he will come when he shall have convenient time. I think you can almost piece together why Apollos wouldn't go there. They named a church after him. It was an insult. He never taught personally that a church should be named in his name, Apollos, for he was a servant of the living God. And I'm sure that's why he, at this moment, just would as soon skip the foray. And, and, uh, and so it is. Uh, uh, churches used by his name, by Cephas' name, by Paul's name, rather than the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 13, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, don't you waver. Quake ye like men, that means act manly. You be a man about it. Be strong. And, and so it is. Uh, and and. When, when this, this sets up and lets you know, when, when, when you um, uh, act like a man, that means uh, it, that, that's not necessarily there's not gender involved in this. It, it means 
Practice tough love if you have to. Keep order. Keep things in order. And sometimes you have to crack the whip a little bit the, to the rod and let that rod come be uh, exposed. That um, God's love doesn't tolerate uh, wickedness. And when, when you act like a man God created or a woman God created, as you should, then people respect that. Verse 14, let all things be done with charity. In other words, do it in love. Even if you have to take out the rod, do that in love. That's tough love. It, it's probably the best, it is some of the best love there is. If you love somebody enough to correct them, uh, most people will just let it slide and say, I don't want to bother with it. I, I just, if, if they want to do that, I, I could care less about them. That's not charity. That's not love. If it's, if it's somebody in your teachings, it is your obligation to be manly about it, to be womanly about it, and correct them. Verse 15, I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, of trouble even, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. And they're addicted to it for what reason? They can't get enough of it. They, they love that word. They love the teaching. And, um, and, and they're going to hang in there. They're going to be steadfast. You can count on them. Verse 16 that you submit yourselves unto, e, uh, unto such and to each one that helpeth, us with us, helpeth with us and laboreth. In other words, you submit, accept them as, as part of the ministry, as part of the family, the family of Christ, the many-membered body that God sends among us so that um, they officiate and practice the very word of God in life. Verse 17, I am glad of the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Archaicus, for that which was lacking on your part, they have supplied. They made up the slack. They made up the difference. Verse 18, for they have refreshed my spirit and yours. Therefore, acknowledge ye them that are such. And, and so it is, you know, those that work with you are with God. Those that work against you are not with God. They are with the other team. So you mark them. But this is why you practice tough love sometimes, is when those shaky edges come up, you make the cut. And so it is. Hopefully, you never have to cut off a part of the body, that is to say, the body of Christ, the many-membered body. If you've got a group that begins teaching far out junk, you've got to break yourself away from them because we don't do junk. We do the Word of God, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. That's why God blesses us and, and uh, progresses us in reaching souls daily from the very Word of God and disciplining yourself within that. You've got to stand fast in faith and your knowledge. Verse 19, the churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord for the church that is in their house. And this is unusual at this time that Paul reverses them again. Usually he has Priscilla first because Priscilla was the teacher. Aquila was not necessarily. As a matter of fact, Paul was so he traveled with them and he was so thought of Priscilla that he had a, a pet name for her in a place or two called Prisca because she, she was a woman preacher and she could get it done. Um, knowing well that um, what you're instructed in this is don't let a woman speak. The word in the Greek is chatter. I don't let anybody chatter when God's word is being taught. But you have many women prophetess that are written in God's Word, and you cannot deny that if you're a student of God's Word. Verse 20, All the brethren greet you. 
greet ye one another with an holy kiss, which was customary at this time. And, and uh, 21, the salutation of me, Paul, with mine own hand. In another place he would say, I'm going to write this real large letters. Why? He could hardly see. And that was one of the thorns that God left in his side after his trip to the third heaven. 22, if any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him, let him be anathema morenthan, morentha. Now, what does that mean? Well, one word is Greek and the other is Aramaic. And uh, so, therefore, you have a division there. But what it means is if they don't love the Lord Jesus Christ, anathema means they're cursed. Okay. And how are they cursed? Because maranatha is our Lord is come and his spirit is with us. And how can you not love him? Why would you want to be, why would you choose to be cursed? Accursed, certainly. And, and, uh, and so it is. So there you have both the Greek and the Aramaic from the same mouth to drive a point home that those that don't love the Lord Jesus Christ, you see where they're going. Anathema. They're cursed. Everything they do in life, they will be cursed. They're not going to prosper. Even if they get ahead a little bit, it's going to fall. Things are going to happen to them. And they're too dumb to realize that. To work against God is to puff into the wind. Okay. You're wasting your time, your life, and everything about it. A truer saying, and maybe the reason for the break, could not be said other than those two words, one in Greek and one in Aramaic, that the one in Aramaic is, our Lord has come, and through the Holy Spirit in the first advent, he certainly has, and his blessings and his love is with us even to this day. Verse 23, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. That's when you love him. Grace uh, meaning unmerited favor meaning you may not deserve it, but he loves you. And when you repent, you're, he's going to forgive you and erase it, whereby you are in good standing. 24, my love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. And this is the first epistle of the Corinthians. It was written from Philippi by Stephanus and Fortunatus and Archaicus uh, and Timotheus, Timothy. It was written there by them, but except for the little signature at the end where Paul would say, look, with, with my own hand. And they could recognize this because it was large and because he could hardly see. What a book, 1 Corinthians, letting you understand life in the flesh and life in the spiritual body. Nailing home the fact that you have two bodies. This flesh body is not your eternal home. It gets sick, it gets old, it gets wrinkled, it, it uh, ages. But your, your real body that was from the first earth age and even that was with the father before you entered your mother's womb is a spiritual body. And it, age has nothing to do with it. And that is the body that ere the silver cord parts and this old clay body break returns instantly to the Father who gave it. That's God's promise, is eternal life for those that love Him. How precious the book, the first Corinthians. Now we come, we're going to start a little bit into the second letter of Paul, an epistle to the Corinthians. And um, uh, we see that he wrote especially under maybe much pressure in this particular one to drive a point home. And I will call attention to that, especially in chapter 11. Chapter one, verse one, Paul the writer, Christ the speaker. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Do not read over that. He is an apostle, what? By the will of God. An apostle of who? An apostle of Jesus Christ. That's Yahweh's savior. And Timothy, 
our brother unto the church of God, those that follow him, the many-membered body, which is at Corinth, uh, with all the saints which are in all Achaia. That, th this is to say it's written to God's elect, those that really should know better and, and know the fact that, yes, he was on the road to Damascus. It wasn't his will. He, his will was to destroy the church, but it was God's will to strike him down in Christ to anoint him and that he would use him to write much of the New Testament. Verse 2, Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. How beautiful that grace is unmerited favor when you repent. Verse 3, here's a most beautiful verse. Absorb it and enjoy it. Blessed be God, that's our Father, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, that is Yeshua the Anointed, the Father of mercies, he shows it, and the God of all comfort. The comfort, of course, is the comforter. You have one verse there with all three within the Godhead mentioned in that one verse, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which is the comforter that comforts all if you will receive it. If you want, then you're not comforted. And you are anathema, that is to say cursed, quite frankly, in everything you do. Not a good way to be. Verse 4, Who comforteth us, in all our tribulation, when, when hard things happen, God is with you in the Comforter, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. There you have the working of the Holy Spirit. It's catching when you're troubled and when you have hardship. Don't worry. He knows the Comforter is there, and He comforts you, whereby you can be manly or womanly about it, take care of business, and be a comfort to those even from whom the trouble came. That's the way the Comforter works, especially those that are in that trial and tribulation. That Comforter is such a warm, loving touch of our Father to those that need Him. He's got time for everyone. And why he sent that comforter is for us today. Even in, in perilous times. Um, not as bad as it was with Paul, who faced death daily, basically. But we still face some pretty tough times. In, in Christianity being belittled by many, made light of by more, and certainly... Um, those old communistic threats that try to drive God even out of your vocabulary, uh, it's very present. But don't worry, they're cursed. And the Comforter is with us. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And within that, at the same time that he's comforting you, he makes it possible for you to help comfort others that are in trial. What, what a loving Father we have and a Comforter that is all-encircling and that um, certainly is with us always. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Let's go with the next verse, verse 5. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. The... the um, the more you suffer, the more he comforts. Please don't ever forget that. It's important. You know, when, when you're suffering and you may, you may go down a little bit, feel down, that's the time he's going to comfort you. Open yourself to it, knowing all the time he is with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. That is so very important. The more you suffer, the more he comforts if you'll stand solid and fast in the faith of knowing his grace is upon you. The comforter is always present with you. You are never alone. Verse 6, And whither we be afflicted, 
it is for your consolation and salvation which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer or whether we be comforted it is for your consolation and salvation that's what it comes down to it's worth it when, when he would face death even on the road you know it was dangerous on the roads then that's why Cephas Peter carried a sword and he drew that sword and lobbed the ear off of uh, Malchus uh, the day Christ was uh, was traitored by Judas why it was dangerous and he was a good swordsman because a good swordsman to lob the cut the ear off without splitting the skull it takes a pretty good swordsman that was old Peter that old apostle of love he was ready and and he took care of business but what he's saying is all this trouble that we go through it's for your sake we're trying to bring salvation to you and make it available to every person we do not want you to be cursed we do not want anathema upon you cursed we want you to be blessed for the Lord has come in what the comforter the comforter is the spirit of the living God and the spirit of the Son and and it is the Holy Spirit and he is always with us verse 7 and our hope of you is steadfast knowing that as ye are partakers of the suffering so shall ye be also of the consolation in knowing that Satan tries to cause suffering upon you that because why, you're doing what's right and he's got your number but Christ has given you the power over all your enemies so naturally that comfort is always going to be there for you and praise God so it is that the comforter will always bring you through don't ever doubt that I mean things may look pretty pretty tough at times but father will never leave you he will never forsake you he is our Heavenly Father all right bless your heart you listen a moment won't you please the mark of the beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you what is the mark of the beast Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are. Back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves, you got a question, you share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend or denomination. We're not going to judge people. We have a judge. It's our Heavenly Father. And he, he is the total judge, the final judge. You do have the right for, of spiritual discernment, letting you know who you should hear, who you should listen to, who you should not listen to. Father is always with us in that regard. Those of you that listen by shortwave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Now, prayer request, you don't need the number, you don't need an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking even. All you have to do, you can pray anytime, anywhere, and no one is even aware of it, especially non-Christians. Let Father know the Comforter is always there for you. What does the Comforter do? He blesses you and comforts you in trials and tribulation. Why? He loves you. Return that love. Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. 
Okay, and question time. We're going to go with Betty from Georgia. What is the parable of the fig tree? The parable of the fig tree is a generation. It is an analogy that was used by the Lord Jesus Christ whereby you would know the final generation. Nobody knows the hour, the time, the second. But God's elect do know the final generation. And it is quite simple. This is why God would would um, vex so-called the fig tree. He knew there was no fruit on it. It was out of season. But there is good figs and there are bad figs. But the important thing is in Jeremiah chapter 24, the generation of the fig tree comes into being when Israel becomes a nation again. It was void of that from Christ's crucifixion all the way up to the year of our Lord, 1948, began the generation of the fig tree, which in that generation all prophecy would be fulfilled of the end times. And we got uh, Carol from California. My question is, since I have become handicapped from a bad fall at work and lost all my income, I have just enough to pay my mortgage and my medicine. Will I be forgiven if I have to bill, if I have to file for bankruptcy? I really have no choice. I need help uh, for my home. Well, I, Talk to him, and what you have to do, you have to do. Um, and what the father does, if you have to do it, um, and you are handicapped, then um, that's, that's your choice. We never give financial advice, so you have to make your own mind. God will understand. Mike from Illinois. Another example of the NIV Bible mistakes. The NIV Bible has the words in saying, this Jesus declared all foods clean in parenthesis after Mark chapter 7, verse 19. That is not in my grandma's 1931 standard uh, King James Bible that we study with. Now, you see, this is why that I don't worry about our students reading a, a bad translation. They know when you study the scriptures chapter by chapter and verse by verse, then you spot this. You know that the food laws have not changed. Our flesh bodies have not changed. What makes them healthy is healthy and what doesn't isn't. But the analogy in this case was what is the, in that particular place, it was changed. And uh, just like I had mentioned the other day, in Ezekiel chapter 13, 18 through 20, they changed again where God said, I'm against those that teach my children to fly to save their souls and cover every knuckle of my outreach saving arms. And the NIV put birds flying, which has nothing to do with what God stated from the manuscripts. Uh, Jane from, from Nebraska, please forgive my ignorance, but my question is still unanswered. If our Savior's name was to be Emmanuel, how is it that he got the name Jesus? Is this his nickname? It's not a nickname. You have to know what Jesus means. It's his duties. It's his job. It's his occupation. It's why he came here in this dispensation of time. It is Yeshua. And it means Yahweh's Savior because the world needed a savior. Where would we be today if his name was not Joshua, if it was not Jesus, our savior? There would be no salvation except by law. And none of us, I guarantee you, we wouldn't make it most likely. So God saw fit that he loved his children, that he said, this is gonna be myself with you, Emmanuel, but the office is my Savior, which is to say Yahweh's Savior, which is to say Jesus, uh, the anointed one. The anointed one meaning he that blesses all anointings and brings forth God's word and comforts those that need comforting. Uh, Marilyn from Iowa, uh, how does one plant a seed without causing trouble? We were in a Bible study in Genesis and 
I sh showed them about the six day creation. I was told that I was crazy and not to talk like that again. And that was my sister telling me that. I was shocked. If there had been, um, if there had been tar and feathers, I, I would have been covered in them. Do you get this reaction? I have studied with you since 2000. I know that you have been a blessing to me and I just can't believe the way people think. I guess I will not have Bible study with my sister again. I do love her. I guess no matter what, I would say I would overload her donkey. You got that right. It, <clears throat> it is sad that some people do not have eyes to see. But bless your heart, still she's your sister. You love her and don't talk Bible with her until the millennium. But as it is written in Ezekiel 40, unless she asks you, then you must answer. But uh, in Ezekiel chapter 44, during the millennium, you're going to be able to help her. You, you will be able to uh, straighten her, and she will know at that time. She will know that what you were saying was true. So love her and... Um, and let the comforter come into your heart. He will comfort you and it'll be just fine. Bernice from North Carolina. My question is when Satan comes and my family does not believe me, when I tell them that he is the Antichrist, and will they give me up to Satan? That, that's, what, um, that's what it's all about. And can Satan stop you from your teaching on television? Uh, he's going to give us free television time and you're going to be in the program. When they deliver you up, those are going to be televised to the world. And you know something, uh, Bernice, it's not going to be you talking, but it's going to be God, the Holy Spirit, speaking through you where the whole world hears. And this is when many of these relatives and seeds you planted, they're going to say, wow, they told me that, she told me, or he told me that a long time ago. And here it's come to pass, and many of them will wake up, uh, and so it will be. <clears throat> okay, uh, Carla from North Carolina. Question, why is Noah referred to as an eighth person in Second Peter 2, 4? And do not the italics tell us there is a minimal amount of text for the right, writers to be sure of this? Well, what it meant was, and properly translated, is um, he, he was the tenth person to be born from Adam, but he was the eighth person being the head on the ark, meaning he, his wife, is two. He had three sons, and they had three wives, naturally. That is six, and six and two is eight. There was eight Adamic souls aboard the ark, but there was also two of every flesh, meaning two of every other race, was aboard that ark, okay? Because God in Genesis chapter six told him, you take two of every flesh aboard that ark. Well, even the Kenites were flesh, and that's why we have Kenites with us even to this day. That's why we have all of the races with us to, to this day. There were only eight Adamic souls through which Christ would come aboard that ark. Noah and his family. Your documentation for that is real easy. It will tell you in Genesis 6 that Noah was the only person on earth who had a, a, a um, good pedigree. That's what the word generation means. Jinnah, ration, meaning his generation was perfect. It hadn't intermixed with the, not he, his wife, nor any of his sons or daughter-in-laws had mixed with the fallen angels. And he was the, that was the only family that was not hybrid out of gear, okay, and, and uh, were qualified to serve the living God through which Christ would come, a clean pedigree, the Savior of all. Okay, we got uh, Carlos from Virginia. In Genesis chapter 4, verses 16 and 17, where did Cain's wife come from? From the land of Nod. That's where part of the six-day creation went. This is why it's very confusing if you don't really translate God's Word properly. There were, all of the races were created on the sixth day. 
and they were to be repopulate the earth. So in the land of Nod, there, part of the six day creation was there and Cain took a wife there, okay? Um, this would be Cindy from Texas. I enjoy your program very much, thank you. Uh, concerning Christ, this kind of got cut a little bit. I'm gonna have to read between the lines here. When, when the Antichrist is here, the time will shorten to five months for God's elect. Does that include everyone on earth? If so, does the six sealed, six trumps, six vials all happen in that five months? Yeah, because, because that's when Satan comes, 666. Six, six. That's what uh, Revelation chapter 13, verse 18 states. Here's wisdom. This is the number of a man. And by this you, will, you can count him. Six, six, six. Six seal, six trump, six vial. And he will appear in that time. Uh, Larry from Ohio. I have a question for you. Where in the Bible does it say that the devil will be turned into ashes? I have looked and have not been able to find it anywhere. It says that. Now in Revelation 20, verse uh, 10 to 15, is that not talking about the judgment of all the sinners and all the earth? Yep, it is. In Revelation 20, 10, it says that the devil shall be tormented day and night. Well, it, it's real easy. You've got to go to the Old Testament. God has foretold us all things in the Old Testament. Ezekiel chapter 28 is where you find it. He is called before his fall the king of Tyre, and after he fell, the prince. Tyrus means, in the Hebrew tongue, is rock. Okay. He's, he's a rock, but he's not our rock. Okay. But it will tell you in that 28th chapter that he was a cherubim, that in the day God created him, he created him the full pattern. I mean, he was beautiful. And he was good that he worked himself up all the way to be the cherubim that protects the mercy seat. That's the seat of Christ. has a messiah connotation. And, and then, uh, as, as that cherubim would protect that, he went bad. And he wanted, to be the, he wanted to be the Christ. And pride did it to him, as you can read. And then God promises in verse 18 and 19 of Ezekiel 28, I will turn you to ashes from within. That's a Hebrew um, a Hebraism that means fini, all over. Samuel from Illinois, please explain Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Well, it's right before the flood, the sons of God, which is to say the fallen angels, they saw women, Adam's daughters, they were beautiful. And rather than being choosing to be born of woman, they rather left their place of habitation, as Jude 6 so declares, which means it was against God's total word and law. Because instead of being born innocent, they weren't, there wasn't anything innocent about them. They were Nephilim, fallen ones. And they seduced women, which produced hybrids, which is to say geber, which is to say giants. And um, they were hybrids, and God had no choice then other than to destroy those families that had mixed, intermixed with those fallen angels. Uh, and that he did. That's why Noah's flood came to be. And that's where in the same chapter that it states that Noah had the only perfect generation, which means pedigree. June from Oregon, do the two witnesses come in human bodies or are they supernatural beings? Well, it's pretty obvious that it's Elijah and Moses, and they did not, whether people say they did or not, Elijah did not die, he was taken, and God wouldn't let anyone bury Moses for a very special reason, and both of them showed up on the Mount of Transfiguration with the Lord Jesus Christ. So, as you will read in Revelation chapter 11, they are not supernatural, but they have supernatural powers as all God's servants do, if you're real careful, that they could do things that um, uh, would, would um, emulate, if you would, even the plagues in Egypt. Joanne from Texas, after the Zadok stand against Satan, this is to say, this is, Zadok is a Hebrew word meaning the elect, okay, the righteous. 
uh, when they stand against Satan after Jesus comes with his army, after Haman, Gog, and Armageddon and the millennium begins, where will the people who are in garden and paradise now be? They won't all be in Jesus' army, and those that are on the wrong side of the gulf won't come with the army. Well, what makes you think they won't? Many of them didn't have an opportunity to hear the truth, okay? And the, so they do come. That's who we teach during the millennium. But, um, and, and, and so it is. Uh, it is written that the rest, when you read carefully in Revelation chapter 15, after the song of Moses is sung, heaven is locked for that thousand-year period. Once the army leaves and those that are on the wrong side of the gulf, heaven is locked, meaning all those that have participated in the first resurrection have participated. No one else can be resurrected. That means gain eternal life for a very good reason. Why? During the millennium because they haven't been tested. This is why Satan is released a short season at the end of the millennium to test those that have been taught in the millennium as to whether they will take part in the second resurrection. Those that participate in the first resurrection, the second resurrection has no power on them. They're, they're home free. But those that do not participate in the second resurrection, Revelation chapter 20, last verses, then they die the second death. And the second death, you sure don't want to go there. It's the death of the soul. Matthew 10, 28, God can cause your soul to perish. He spoke and nothing became everything and he can speak and everything can become nothing. Okay? God is a consuming fire. Uh, Christine from New Mexico, where in the Bible can I find the Song of Solomon? The Song of Solomon is just before the book of Isaiah. Now, in some Bibles, the Song of Solomon is called Canicles. Okay. But, you know, so, so check in the beginning of your Bible and look. You will either find it under the title Canicles or Songs of Solomon, but it's the first book, if I'm not mistaken, right before Isaiah. So you'll find it there. It's the greatest love story ever told. It's the story of Christ's love for his people. Uh, Thelma from Indiana. I want to know if I've been saved. I have asked the Lord for forgiveness. I have terminal, terminal bone cancer, and I want to find my way home to the Lord. Well, Thelma, you've already done it, dear. You, you've, um, you've asked his forgiveness. If, if you ask his forgiveness, it means you're a believer. And the simplicity of the fact is, is John 3, 16. God so loved this world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever should, whosoever should believe upon him by asking forgiveness shall not perish meaning you will not go to hell, but will have eternal, everlasting life. Welcome aboard, sister. You're in good shape. Don't you let anyone take that away from you. You, you stand steadfast, and we ask God's blessings upon you, and we'll keep you in our prayers. Johnny from Alabama, is it wrong to eat in a church fellowship building if it is outside the church building? I, I, I see nothing wrong with it. Um, and um, it's, uh, it's, it's, if it's a rec hall or a place uh, outside of the sanctuary, then there's nothing wrong with having church socials there as long as it's good Christian food. Donald from Oregon, in, in P, is in Peter referring to the 1,000 years, is he meaning an undetermined amount of time? No, he means... A, one day with the Lord is as a thousand years with man. So it is the Lord's day. That's how long the millennium is. It's a thousand year period and it's very specific. You, you can read that again in the 20th chapter of Revelation. It's a thousand years. It's the Lord's day. And um, one of the better places you can read about the Lord's day is in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. That uh, when the Lord's day comes, all the... 
uh, elements, rudiments are going to be destroyed. That's the bad stuff. And uh, this would be, um, I watch, I'm look, David from Iowa. Pastor Murray, when do, when do we receive our robes we'll be wearing? The moment you die or just when? I don't want to stand naked before Jesus and God. Well, I don't blame you. But you want to you want to read Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 and 8, and find out what that robe's made out of. It's very important if you don't want to be naked. Because it's made up of your righteous acts that weaves the fine linen that you wear. And those people that don't have any righteous acts, they're not going to have any linen. And that leaves them in pretty pretty bad shape as far as clothing is concerned. Frida from Tennessee, not a pretty sight, okay? Frida from Tennessee, can you please explain to me what is meant when some people say that the church is going to be raptured away? Well, it, it means they're mistaken, totally and completely. Nowhere in God's Word does it say the rapture, the church is going to be raptured away unless it's some writing by man that's been placed there, okay? The word rapture is not even in the Bible. Christ is coming here to bring salvation. We're not going there, okay? And, and, and so it is that our Father does this. How precious it is. Uh, uh, don't let anyone mislead you in that. Okay, and um, so, and we're out of time. Hey, you've got to go here. God loves you. We love you. Make his day. He makes yours. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, bless God, he will always bless you. Most important, though, you listen to me, listen good now. You stay in his word. Every day in his word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? Because Jesus Yeshua, he is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas. 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you.